In the end, every state voted no. So did the Northern Territory. The ACT was the only jurisdiction to support an Indigenous voice in the Constitution. The overwhelming rejection of this referendum is a blow for Anthony Albanese, who says he accepts the result and takes responsibility. He's called for a new national purpose to tackle Indigenous disadvantage, but the path forward on closing the gap is now unclear, as is the prospect of any constitutional recognition. Both the Prime Minister and opposition leader spoke last night about the need for the nation to come together. Yet there was still plenty of finger-pointing last night and little sign of cooperation. There's a splinter in the mud. We've been on the path to the voice referendum. Joining me now live for more on this is the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. Good morning, PM. Good morning. Good morning, Michael. We're live now in Canberra. PM, good morning to you. Good morning, Mel. The Prime Minister is now trying to look busy as we approach the weekend for the voice vote. Guess what, folks? It's just one page. On Saturday, all Australians can bring the beauty of this artwork to life. Yes, no, no, no. no, we want to work with the Yes campaigners after this uh, referendum. It's been the most divisive referendum that our nation's ever experienced. Yes, yes. My concern is for having led my people to trust in the Australian people. And if that trust is not repaid, then I'm kind of a... I feel like I'm a bit accountable for that. I call upon my fellow Australians to vote yes tomorrow. Well, after months of campaigning, Australians are heading to the polls this morning. It's the exercise of Australian democracy. Oh. Tell me when you're ready. <laughs> We're quietly... Are feeling good. Which way are we voting? Yeah! Sad yeah. I ask Australians to vote yes today. I voted no to Mr Albanese's divisive voice of division. The no campaign has spoken about division while stoking it. Uh, I don't think they've been too influenced by what uh, the Liberal Party's had to say. Martin Luther King said, the arc of history bends towards justice. And it does bend. How dare 97% of this country decide our destiny? And I sincerely hope Australians vote yes. Thanks very much. Polls are about to close in New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and the ACT. We believe the ACT has voted yes. We're prepared to call New South Wales as having voted no. It is a grim picture for the yes campaign. We are now prepared to call South Australia no victory. The small regional booths so far show a pretty strong result for no. Australia has voted no. This will be a difficult moment for many First Nations people. There has been some really uh, horrible uh, political campaigning uh, from Peter Dutton. We have been accused of misleading this country through disinformation and misinformation when it was a campaign of no information. Uh, this is not the end of reconciliation. Is reconciliation now dead in this country? Oh, no, no way it's dead. This is a very sad moment in the country's history. As Prime Minister, I will always accept responsibility for the decisions I've taken. You can hear the words almost of contempt uh, for the Australian people dripping from, uh, from what he's saying. No referendum has succeeded without bipartisan support. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know where I belong. And my guests this morning on this special 90-minute edition of the program are the Deputy Prime Minister, Richard Miles, and Liberal MP, Julian Lisa. First, let's check what's making news, and here are some of the front pages. This morning, voters silence voice in the Sunday Age. Australia says no in the Sun Herald. In the Sunday Herald Sun, time to unite. And what now, asks the Sunday Territorian. Indigenous campaigners for The Voice say they will fall silent for a week as they grieve the outcome. 
and have called for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags to be lowered to half-mast to reflect the loss they feel. Here was the Prime Minister and Opposition Leader speaking after last night's result. Just as the Uluru Statement from the Heart was an invitation extended with humility, grace and optimism for the future, tonight we must meet this result with the same grace and humility. And tomorrow we must seek a new way forward with the same optimism. Tonight, while the majority of Australians will be pleased with the outcome, there of course will be Australians who will be disappointed as well. But what matters tomorrow is that this result doesn't divide us as a people. What matters is that we all accept the result in this great spirit of our democracy. And briefly in some other news this morning, further evacuation flights for Australians stuck in Israel were cancelled last night due to safety concerns. A ground invasion of Gaza is considered imminent. We'll talk to the Deputy Prime Minister about that and we'll cross to Jerusalem later. And finally, New Zealand has voted for change after six years of Labor rule under Jacinta Ardern and Chris Hipkins. National Party leader Christopher Luxon is set to become Prime Minister after a decisive election win last night. Well, we'll get to our panel in a moment. First, let's take a quick look at where the numbers fell in last night's referendum count with ABC data journalist and Insiders regular Casey Briggs. Well, David, the result is clear-cut. These numbers will shift a little bit because counting isn't quite finished yet. But at the moment, we're looking at about a 60-40 result in no's favour. That is a couple of points less than our average of the polls that we've been seeing in the last couple of weeks. Again, these numbers will shift. It is a little bit early to say which pollster has been more accurate or, or not. Um, certainly some of them will have been more accurate than others, but we just don't know which ones yet because we need to see the final figures. These are the state's uh, results. I'm actually going to order them from most supportive of The Voice to least, so the Territory, the ACT, uh, with the strongest, the only jurisdiction to vote yes. Victoria was the state that came the closest to voting majority yes, then New South Wales and Tasmania. The Northern Territory in the middle of the list here. Um, again, counting is still uh, underway. We, we are waiting on some votes still from the Northern Territory. The pattern in the NT has been that the urban areas vote no, while the remote mobile polling teams that tour the top end going to remote Indigenous communities, they have largely voted yes. Western Australia, South Australia and then Queensland with the lowest support at this stage. So every state has voted no, but within those states there are pockets of yes. It's about 30, just over 30 seats uh, that appear to have voted yes or are leaning that way. I just want to show them to you. Top of the list is Melbourne, 78% yes. This is, of course, the Greens leader's seat, uh, Adam Bant's seat of Melbourne. Graindler, the Prime Minister's seat, Anthony Albanese's seat, three quarters of people have voted yes. Going down the list, we've got Sydney, Canberra, Cooper, McNamara, Wills. We've got St Teal Independence, Wentworth. We've got Kuyong and North Sydney and Warringah. Keeping going down, Hobart, the seat of Clark, is voting yes all the way down. Uh, we also have, just want to point out the seat of Bradfield. This, at the moment, on the numbers we've got at the moment, are the on is the only Liberal-held seat that looks to have voted yes. I just want to cut this list two other ways very quickly. These are the teal seats overwhelmingly voting yes, all of them leaning. McKellar and Curtin, we're not yet projecting uh, one way or the other. More counting to happen there. But on these numbers, every teal seat is voting yes. And these are the seats uh, where the Greens did very well last election. They polled at least 20% of the vote. And again, in almost all of those, uh, we have a yes vote. So that's the pockets of yes in a map that looks very orange. We talked about Melbourne and Grainla. I just want to point out one more. This is Maranoa. This is the Nationals leader, uh, the, the seat of the Nationals leader, David Littleproud. It is the strongest no vote in the country. So we have leaders on either end of the spectrum here. And then these pockets of purple for yes. Let's just look at two cities. Sydney is one of them. What's really interesting here is just how stark this divide is. The inner city and the uh, north shore of Sydney voting yes. We've seen some of those seats. Uh, the western suburbs voting no. That includes the seat of Barton. That is the, uh, that is the Indigenous Affairs Minister, Linda Burney's seat. Also the seat of Barawa. That is the former shadow Indigenous Affairs spokesman, uh, Julian Lisa's seat. And then the same pattern in Melbourne. The inner cities have voted yes. The outer suburbs have voted no. 
We're going to have to dig into exactly why that is. I think there's a lot of research to come, but there's strong correlations here uh, in yes note and no vote when you look at uh, wealth. There is a correlation here, wealthier areas voting yes. When you look at age, when you look at just distance from capital cities. And the other really strong correlation is when you look back to the last referendum we had 24 years ago, Look at the results of the 1999 Republic referendum. Only a couple of dozen seats have voted differently to how they voted last night. Really interesting to see that the results have just mirrored so closely that of our last referendum, David. Casey Briggs, thank you. Fascinating to see uh, some of the detail there and that geographic divide between the yes and no as well. Let's bring in the panel. We're joined this morning by David Crow, Isabella Higgins and John Paul Janke. Great to have you all here. Good morning. Thanks so well. much for joining us. Um, JP, first to you. Uh, look, the, the overall result looks pretty close to what the polls were saying, so in one sense, not surprising. But it is remarkable when you look at where the support levels were for, for, for The Voice at the start of the year. What happened? Yeah, I think it was an interesting result. The states that probably we thought were going to be really close didn't turn out to be close at all. And the resources and the, the last-minute campaigning that went in to try and flip those states just never changed uh, the vote to a majority, which, is, which, which was surprising. Yeah, the big question is why, um, Isabella? What do you think? Why has Australia voted this way? I spent a bit of time at polling booths this week and I was surprised by the number of people who said, I don't get it, it's too hard, so I'm going to vote no, just from travelling around the country, that was a message I was getting a lot, is that people still didn't get this weeks out and we were hearing that from the Yes campaigners as well, saying uh, from Anthony Albanese a week out from this referendum, we think 25% of people haven't decided yet. I mean, that's leaving a lot of truth-telling, a lot of winning over the hearts and minds to the final seven days of this campaign. It was a huge job for them and they just couldn't do it in seven days. It was a difficult proposal, I think, for some people to get their heads around. I think for those who perhaps don't understand the lives of Indigenous Australians, who don't understand the inequity, the challenges, to then try and understand this proposal and how that could potentially fix some of these things, it was too much for them to get their head around. And in seven days, that just wasn't going to happen. Well, I mean, you know, many would argue it's been around for six and a half years, this idea, since the Uluru Statement. But, David, do you agree that ultimately there's a lot of Australians who just didn't understand what this new body, what this proposal was all about. Yes, and our reporters found the same kind of thing when they went to places like Moree and Wilcannia, not just the suburbs in the city. Um, the Yes campaign was relying, I think, too much on a late move to persuade people to get them over the line. And I think the No campaign had been much more effective through the course of this year in questioning this proposal. And let's face it, the proposal was put to Australians uh, without going to a full sort of multi partisan effort, whether you call it a constitutional convention or something else, to get all sides around yeah, it. I mean, look, so it didn't have that. The Uluru Dialogues were a constitutional convention, but they were for Indigenous Australians, exactly. non-Indigenous non Australians and the sort of constitutional convention that, that you know, came before the Republic vote. And in this situation, you don't just need a consensus among those who are putting the proposal. You've got to take it to the people. You need their votes in a referendum. So it didn't have that, and this gets back to the issue of people being unsure about it. When they can see all this division, people were unsure. There were lies and there, were, there was misinformation through the campaign. That's true. But yeah. there was also a big question about the model and people were not sure about that model. There was also division among Indigenous leaders. Every Australian could see that there wasn't a consensus among Indigenous leaders. And so asking Australians to vote for something where there were Indigenous leaders on all sides, really, Lydia Thorpe, Jacinta Nampajimpa Price, Linda Burney, asking Australians to vote for it in that situation was difficult. Well, there's a couple of things in, in that, just on that division. I mean, it's, it's, it's true that the, certainly having Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine fronting the no campaign, um, it, it, it did confuse a lot of non-Indigenous Australians, I suppose, Isabella. I think she was an incredibly potent campaigner. I think the fact that she was a, a relatively young Indigenous woman out there saying things that we often hear from a very different demographic, saying things like 
colonisation hasn't negatively mm. impacted Aboriginal people. I mean, that is patently untrue. But to see someone who looks like that, who's from this community, saying that, I mean, that absolutely confuses the Australian public. It's not true, but because she's saying it, people question it. People wanted to believe yeah, it was true. Yeah. So and she then, had this yeah. powerful message yeah. that tapped into something they wanted to hear. But I, I also think that one of her other messages last night, Australia is not a racist country, you know, People, that resonates as well. Of course it does. Yeah, sure. The misinformation, JP, David mentions it, it was there. It was um, huge. Is it fair to blame every, this result on the misinformation? What, what role did it play? I think we found early on that people's perception and understanding of our constitution is just not there. The, the difference between constitutional change and legis legislative change was not there. Mm. So to educate... We don't do this very often, do exactly. we? Exactly. <laughs> so to educate people about the constitution, and I did Vox Pops in Rockhampton the very start of this, and I said... Do you, have you read our constitution? And people just went, no. People, haven't, uh, people actually thought that there was freedom of speech in our constitution. So a lot of uneducated people about our constitution, which is understandable, um, and then to bring in major change about First Nations people, when the majority of people have not met Aboriginal people, they see Aboriginal people on the television, in the media, they get their perceptions from the media, so to put those two together, it, it creates the perfect storm, I think, for misinformation. And misinformation played a big part in this. I think we can't estimate that. The feedback that we were getting from Western Sydney was that, you know, the fear of, I'm going to lose my house. If the voice gets up, I'm going to lose my house. It's giving them extra rights that I don't have. And that really played a part. And importantly, look, we've asked pe people on the no side, you know, was it your job to call that out? If, and we even asked Barnaby Joyce last night on the program, you were campaigning, if someone came up to you and said, if, are they going to take my house? Do you say, no, look, that's not true. I want this to be argued on the facts. Yeah, what did he so say to that? He just said, look, there's lots of, lots of other talk, right? So they let the bushfire, we've got to admit, they let the bushfire burn away and create smoke to cloud the issue. They never went back and corrected it to have this respectful debate on the facts, on the detail, which they were saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I did see uh, Jacinta... Nampajipa Price in her comments last night, she said, yeah, we were accused of misinformation, but pointed out on the other side, there was this long-running claim that 80% of Indigenous Australians supported, which an early poll had found, I think, back in January, February. But anyway, she was saying that was misinformation from the yes <laughs> side as well. Well, it's interesting for me. I, I, it's ironic that the misinformation about it's a land grab and if the voice gets up, they're going to claim my house or my office. Mm. Or like, it's, it's kind of the original sin of Australia, isn't it, that the theft of land... Uh, from someone else and giving it to someone else. So it sort of... Mm. Yeah, it was On social media, for sure, reparations was running as, as, an issue, as, a, really as, a, as, a, as a sort of quote with no context. Just yeah. fear and compensation, pay the rent. These phrases that are loaded with, you know, the, the perception of payment and land issues and so forth, where uh, there, were just no, there was no context, mm, to, yeah. but they were... They were very powerful on social media, I think. And it's interesting as well, I think, now that we can see that wealthier electorates were more inclined to mm. vote yes. And I think if we really peel back some of the rhetoric that was reasons why people were voting no, underneath it was, what are they getting that I don't have? Yeah. I think that was really what people were saying. Yeah. It's a cost of living crisis. It's a hard time for some people. I don't feel like they should get more than me. I think if we really strip it back, that's what some people yeah. were and saying. And you look at Canberra the only jurisdiction to vote yes. They've had an elected body that has been advising the local assembly since 2004. So there was really no fear there that this mm. is going to take my land and give the Indigenous people the ACT extra rights. Look, the Prime Minister uh, last night, he accepted responsibility for his decisions, he said, but then he was also pretty keen to blame this outcome on the lack of bipartisanship. Why do you think Australians voted no? Well, the, the analysis will go on for, for some time, no doubt. But the truth is that no referendum has succeeded without bipartisan support in this country. None. I mean, Peter Dutton said after that that there was arrogance from the Prime Minister dripping with contempt for the way the Australian people had voted. David, did he need to show... Um, more contrition for where the government might have got this wrong? He took responsibility. I th he took responsibility in those words last night. I thought it was a good speech that he made. He acknowledged that referendums don't get up without bipartisan support, and yet he decided to go to this referendum without bipartisan support. So I think that reflects on his judgment. His judgment in 
taking this path from the very beginning, mm. uh, let's say a year ago, where it could have been taken on a different path, and through this year, even as late as June, when it was clear that the mood was turning against and maybe a different assessment needed to be made, and also responsibility in terms of the day-to-day -day running of the campaign, which I don't think had strong central control in government to unify with Yes23. So there were problems at multiple levels, and that has to be something that Anthony Albanese takes responsibility for. Uh, I think, crucially, the model itself was, the, was, was a key issue here, and all the indications were that Australians didn't like this model of an elected group where, as Isabella pointed out, you know, there's a, the elected right for the Indigenous voice and other people don't get that. That was a problem. Um, they could have taken a different path. Indigenous leaders didn't want that. Anthony Albanese locked in with that and we see the result. Well, we come, we'll come back to, to that point uh, and also what this result means for Indigenous Australians and the very uncertain path forward now when it comes to closing the gap or indeed constitutional recognition. Uh, time, though, now to talk to the Deputy Prime Minister, Richard Miles, to take us there. He was the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, Jacinta Numpanjimpa Price, last night, welcoming the no result. They've said no to grievance uh, and, and, and the push from activists to suggest that we are a racist country when we are absolutely not a racist country. We are one of the, if not the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And it's time for Australians to believe that once again, to be proud to call ourselves Australian. Richard Miles, welcome to the program. Thanks, David. So did the Australian people get it right with this decision? Oh, the Australian people always get it right. Um, and we uh, acknowledge the result of this referendum. Obviously, for those of us who are supporting the Yes campaign, um, it's, it wasn't the night we hoped for, and, and I am disappointed. But uh, the Australian people always get it right. And we absolutely accept this result. And uh, what this means is that, you know, Australians don't want to see uh, this pursued through a change to the Constitution. But I don't take last night as, as any vote against reconciliation. And, and I think both sides of the argument made that clear, even in their comments after the results last night. Nor do I take this as a vote against a will on the part of the Australian people to see a closing of the gap in social disadvantage which affects Indigenous Australians. And again, I think when you look at the way in which both cases ran their arguments and responded to the result last night, uh, it's clear that everyone wants to see the gap closed. And, and really what I take out of this now uh, to, try and, to try and walk forward in, in a way which is positive is that <clears throat> I think coming out of this referendum there is a greater call for action on closing the gap. I think Australians yesterday, whether they voted yes or no, would see that a situation where a group of our fellow citizens, by virtue of their birth, are living shorter and less healthy lives is fundamentally unfair and we need to, to act to, to, to change that and, and to close the gap. And, you know, from the government's point of view, obviously... Uh, that is now our focus. Uh, the Australian people have asked us to do this in a different way. Um, we hear that and we'll do that and, and we'll now look, look at how we can uh, work harder to, to close the gap and, 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 and do I'll, so across I'll, the I'll come to how you're going to do that, but if the Australian people got it right here, do you therefore concede uh, that the government could have done better, either with the, how this was put together or the way it was sold, the way you explained this to the Australian people? Look, we take responsibility, as the Prime Minister did last night, for um, the, the referendum and, and we take responsibility for the outcome. Uh, but but I'd, I would say this. Um, this referendum um, was the end step in a process which has been going on for the better part of a decade and in some respects longer. I mean, it was the, the Howard government which first talked about having recognition for Indigenous Australians in the Constitution. And it was the Abbott government who said that the way in which we should recognise Indigenous Australians is by asking Indigenous Australians how they want to be recognised in the Constitution. And that 
call really led to you know thousands of meetings, which ultimately saw the meeting in 2017 at Uluru of Indigenous leaders, which issued the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And and all we've done, in a sense, is bring that to its final conclusion and take it, that it, to the Australian yes, people, that's, that's which, is, which is what was, was sought. But there was but, still but, a big decision just say to press this, ahead with we, it. We, we, Sorry. Sure. But, but, but it was the commitment we made at the last election. Yeah that we would take this to the Australian people and we honour our commitments. And, I'm, and, I'm just interested and in so point, though, what we have done is follow through on that. When it became clear uh, that there would be no bipartisanship around this, we all know there's never been a, a referendum win without bipartisanship. When that was clear, was there any consideration about what to do, whether to press ahead still in light of all that history? Um, was that weighed up? Oh, well, I mean, you, we always weigh these issues up, but, but let's think this through, David. Um, I mean, yes, uh, the moment that it became a, a contested referendum in that sense, the moment it stopped being bipartisan, uh, this became much more difficult. Uh, we were completely aware of that. Um, what was your view sometimes... Do you think it was still a good idea to press on? Well, Absolutely, because uh, there are times where difficult things are achieved. You know, did we understand that it was more difficult? Of course we did. Um, but we didn't go to the election uh, saying we will take this to the Australian people so long as Peter Dutton agrees. We said we would take it to the Australian people, that that was the culmination uh, of a process which had bound away for a very long period of time. Um, now, what Peter Dutton did is a matter for him ultimately, um, but our commitment was that we would take this to the Australian people and we weren't offering anybody else a, a right of veto in relation to that. This was keeping faith with our promises to the Australian people in May of last year and, and I think particularly keeping faith uh, with Indigenous Australians who I am certain uh, in large measure wanted to see uh, this proposition put to the Australian people to, to give um, or to take the next step um, in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And so, you know, I don't have any regrets that, that we took this to a referendum. Uh, that said, obviously, we, we completely accept the result. And the result is clear that in moving forward, you know, we are not moving forward by virtue of changing the constitution. And, and, and the Australian people have spoken very clearly about that. So no, no other attempt at constitutional recognition. That's it. No, that's right. And, and uh, you know, again, we, you know, we heard Peter Dutton talking potentially about another referendum. Uh, our view was that this was the process uh, that had been embarked on over a significant period of time that we were keeping faith with. We were, we were committed to putting this to the Australian people and we've done that and, and that's that. Now, we, we gave it our best shot. Um, and I might say, you know, we, we saw 60,000 uh, volunteers around the country uh, trying to convince their fellow Australians about the merits of voting yes in this campaign. I mean, it was um, a huge effort. And, and so we, we very much did give it our best shot. Um, but, but, that, but that's know, it, we, you've we, just we've said. We've come so, up short. And so, uh, just, just to explain to viewers here, a lot of people want to see some sort of recognition in our nation's founding document for that, that long history, 65,000 plus years uh, of First Nations history. The opposition says they support some sort of symbolic recognition as well. You're saying no. Well, we're not moving down the path of another referendum. We, we, we've been making that clear uh, for some time. I mean, th this was what we put forward, and I think the Australian people have made their position a, very and clear. A, and, and that's a never And, and, and I like come back to your... In the next term, or well, you, you might return to this. Well, well, well the, 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 I'm speaking on behalf of our government, um, and, uh, and, and you asked me the, the, the very appropriate question at the start. Did the Australian people get this right? And the Australian people always get it right, and we have listened to them. OK. Um, and, you know, it's not... This is not the result, obviously, I wanted. You know, I, was, I, I passionately believed in, in changing the constitution, but, but we have put this to the Australian people, and there is an answer. Now, I... I I, as I said earlier, this is not a vote against reconciliation, nor is it a vote against closing the gap. And that's where our focus 
now needs to be and, and we will work with Indigenous Australians, we'll definitely listen to them very closely about how we can take steps forward um, in closing the gap. I, I really do hope that coming out of this there is in fact an increased appetite uh, to put in place programs which can close the gap, but, but that's where our focus is now. And, and, and I understand the government um, wants to take some time to work out uh, what those steps will be to close the gap, but for, for right now, um, can I just ask you about where this does leave Indigenous Australians, whether this process has been worthwhile because Marcia Langton says the nation's been poisoned, there's no fix for this terrible outcome. Noel Pearson warned that a no vote would mean endless division and mutual suspicion. Your colleague Pat Dodson said a no vote would say to Indigenous Australians they have no legitimacy here, no right to be here. Does this leave Indigenous Australians in a worse position today than they were before this whole exercise? Well, I, I, I certainly, uh, I, I suppose my sadness today, um, I feel most acutely in terms of how this does bear on uh, Indigenous Australians. They, they will be hurting today and you can um, see that in the comments that you've just referred to. And I think that uh, does require all of us in this moment uh, to be embracing Indigenous Australians. Um, I, 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 I do feel uh, that, as I said, there is, uh, I hope, an increased appetite to act on closing the gap. I definitely feel that this is not a vote against reconciliation. I think it really is important um, as we move forward now and seek to bring the country together that we do have a particular focus on Indigenous Australians because I can completely understand um, how there will be a feeling of hurt on their part today. Um, but you know this is a this is a, a long journey, um, and, and just on that journey you know, we, too. We, and um, this is a step in that journey. Is the government committed to any sort of truth telling process, as as called for by the Uluru statement? Uh, well, again, we we, we have. Uh, we have committed to implementing the Uluru Statement in full. That's that's what we have taken to the Australian people and that's been our articulated position uh, for a long time. I think in terms of the specific steps forward and, and, and what we do now, um, come back to a comment you made earlier, I think you know, we need to let the dust settle here. Right now I think it is about um, really standing with and embracing Indigenous Australia. A lot of them are um, saying, in this moment. even Pat Dodson and I think, has said and there I needs think to be a process. And I think we need to work through what it, the programs are then yeah. going to I mean, even, even Pat Dodson, your colleague, has said there needs to be a process after a no result um, that goes to truth-telling. Sure. Are you, are you just not sure whether oh. that's something you'll do at the moment? No, we've made clear um, that we support the Uluru Statement from the heart, and, and that is a part of it. Um, and, and so, so the, you know, the, the, the principal commitment to everything that's contained in there we have made and we don't move away from. I think in terms of exactly what the, 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 the precise steps forward are from here is a matter that we need to take some time okay. to, to work through, and I think people can understand that. Let me turn to the situation in Israel. Uh, further uh, Australian repatriation flights had to be cancelled last night because of safety concerns. What's the update this morning? Are there going to be any more flights? Well, we are working very um, intently on that. Um, it, it's hard to commit to this because um, this can literally change at any moment. Uh, I mean, this is determined uh, on the basis of, um, well, the starters, whether or not you know, Israel's airspace remains open as, as just one example. But what I can say, David, is that options both um, in terms of civil contracted flights and military Royal Australian Air Force flights are uh, actively being worked on. We are positioned. We, are, um, we have the intent uh, to be able to put in place flights um, very, very soon, I mean, almost immediately, um, and we are continuing to walk down that path. As I say, I'm reluctant to, to go into the specifics of it because sure, they literally what said, can if, change. If the civilian uh, flights can't instance. get in, it sounds like you're saying you've got military uh, planes ready to go in the region. We do, yes, we do, and and uh, and and there is uh, some greater flexibility mm. that military flights offer um, in in this circumstance. But again, there are other circumstances beyond our control, which which potentially make it make it all difficult. But yeah. uh, look, we're we're very mindful of uh, Australians in Israel who want to leave um, a significant number. How many are still there trying to get uh, out? Obviously. 
Uh, well, again, I'm reluctant to go into to the specifics of it. That there are about ten thousand Australians who are in Israel, but you know, a lot of those are dual citizens, and certainly not all of those are seeking to leave. The numbers who are seeking to leave, you know, measured in 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 the hundreds um, uh, and the high hundreds, uh, and so we're we're working through those that have registered around that, and and looking at um, obviously every available option to try and uh, assist those Australians in leaving. Look, Israel has a right to defend itself clearly after what we saw uh, a week ago with those brutal uh, Hamas attacks. But do you think Israel also has a right now to do what it's done in cutting off food, fuel and water supplies to the civilians in Gaza? Uh, well, Israel does have a right to defend itself. And in doing that, Israel does have a right to act against Hamas. I mean, what we saw last weekend was an act of terror and an act of terror that was wrought upon innocent people. Um, and in that sense, you know, what we witnessed last weekend was murder. And, and it is an absolute tragedy what is now playing out. It's, it's, it's a tragedy for uh, the innocent uh, Israelis who have been victims of this, but it's obviously a tragedy uh, for innocent Palestinians who now find themselves in the middle of this as well. Um, we, we join um, the call of other nations in, in, in saying to, to Israel that in having a right to defend itself, Obviously, it needs to do that in a way where it acts in accordance with the rules of war, um, and and that's and that's very clear. Um, and and indeed, Israel have made comments saying that that is how they will proceed. Um, and are they doing that? Sitting, are they doing that right um, now, acting within the rules well, of war? Well, I, I'm I'm not about to cast a judgment on the on what they are doing now, um, and that's the way in which I would answer the, your question. And the reason I would answer well, it in that way I, is I'm, I'm obviously I'm not puzzled by that. Sitting, you can't well, say I, that I'm, Israel's acting well, I, within the rules of war right now. Uh, I, I'm 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 saying that 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 I, uh, I think Israel is acting within the rules of war. Okay. And I'm not casting a negative judgment on what they're doing, and I I you know, but I guess I'm making this point. I'm not sitting um, in their control room either, and I don't have all the information available to me that they will have to them, obviously. Um, uh, but it is very important that as Israel walks forward um, while having the right to defend itself, and that means acting against Hamas, uh, they do act within the rules of war. Final one uh, for you, Deputy Prime Minister. Iran's role uh, in this, what role do you think it has played in supporting those Hamas attacks? And should Australia reconsider its diplomatic ties with Iran? Uh, it, um, it, it, it's difficult to, to, to comment on that. Um, we, uh, I, I, mean, I think we can make the observation here that um, the strategic... Um, I mean, this this whole incident has been a tragedy, I think, for the world. Um, if there is anyone who has, or any country that has moved forward strategically in the context of this, it probably is Iran. Um, but that doesn't then mean, um, you know, we don't, I don't have information which links Iran to what has occurred. Um, you know, we maintain a, uh, a diplomatic mission in Iran. That's an important mission for us. Um, why? why? And, and is that under that. consideration, reconsideration? Why, why do we still have that diplomatic relationship? Uh, well, we... we uh, I mean, we seek to have diplomatic relationships as broadly as we can. Um, that mission in Iran um, plays a very important role uh, in Australia's national interest um, and... and and, it is, and we value that mission in Iran. Now, that doesn't then mean that we are uh, signing up to what Iran does. Clearly, we're not. We have been condemning Iran um, not only in respect of its engagement internationally, but also in respect of its engagement uh, um, in domestically. And we have a number of sanctions in place in respect of Iran. And, uh, and we will continue to speak very robustly uh, around Iran's behaviour. Um, but, you know, diplomatic missions are, are not just there um, when you have good relationships with countries. Uh, in some respects, some of the most important diplom diplomatic missions one has in place uh, are where the relationships are at their most difficult, and that would be a fair way to describe our relationship with Iran. All right. Defence Minister and Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles, appreciate you joining us this morning. Thank you. Thanks, David. We're going to hear now from Liberal MP Julian Lisa, who quit the shadow ministry to support the yes case in the referendum. To take us there, here was the Prime Minister last night on the way forward from here. 
We intend as a government to continue to do what we can to close the gap, to do what we can to advance reconciliation, to do what we can to listen to the First Australians. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Julian Lisa, welcome to the program. Thanks, Doug. Keen to get your thoughts uh, too on Israel and Gaza, but let's start with the result last night. Why do you think Australians voted no to the voice? Well, firstly, I want to say I respect the decision of Australians to, uh, to, to vote no here. This is a privilege that the framers of the Constitution gave each of us to have the chance to have our own say about whether the Constitution should be changed. And ultimately, uh, Australians didn't uh, support and were not convinced by the arguments that were put by the Yes case in relation to why we should uh, recognise Indigenous people in the Constitution through a voice. Um, I think there's a couple of, of, of issues about why that, that occurred. Um, I think, and I say this with no malice because I campaigned with the Prime Minister and I respect his commitment on, on these issues and I campaigned alongside the government on this. I think there are a couple of key decisions that, uh, that, that have been made over the years that uh, uh, could, have been, could have helped garner more yes votes. I think the first was um, to abandon the process that Ken Wyatt had begun of rolling out the local and regional voice bodies first. I think they would have created a sense of confidence and understanding about what it is that the voice would do when we're talking about a national body. And I think the second thing was a, a partly an overconfidence because of the high polls of this uh, last year, because of the government's own electoral success at the last election, because of the result in the marriage survey, that this was going to be an easier ask than it actually was. Um, as we know now, eight out of 45 occasions referendum hasn't succeeded and I think that that, that overconfidence uh, affected all of the decisions that were made in relation to, to the process. And uh, while, I, while I think, you know, in reflection it would have been good to have as sort of a, a tripartite co-design um, of what was eventually going to be put to the Australian people and, and that didn't happen. So if there had been a co-design of uh, this voice model, do you really think that would have dealt with the concerns raised by some of your colleagues, most notably Jacinta Numpajimba Price, that the voice divides us on race? Well, it's not just the co-design of the voice model, it's the co-design of whatever referendum question that you actually ended up putting to mm. people, whatever change to the constitution that was made and whatever the national body looked like. They were the things that people had continued to have questions about and where there was confusion in the mind of voters. Mm. And I think ultimately having a process that, uh, that brought everybody with us because... Uh, we know, as an Indigenous um, leader in Tasmania said to me, um, a referendum is a big ask of, of Australians. Um, uh, we needed to do everything that we could to try and maximise that yes vote. But I, I guess my, my question goes to whether it was ever possible, even if you had this co-design process, was it ever possible to convince the likes of Jacinta Price in particular, who is very influential in this no campaign, yes. that putting a voice in the constitution would be a good idea? Well, I'm not sure she would have come at, at the voice to the Constitution. I mean, Jacinta um, and I have known each other a long time. Uh, we first appeared on a panel long before she was in the Parliament on, on this, and she's, she's not been a supporter of the voice in the Constitution. But the question was then, well, what could we do by way of referendum uh, and a package of reforms that might have got you there? And what could you do in relation to spelling out some more of what the national body might do that might have helped... Um, uh, us get to a yes vote last night. That, that, that's the point but I if, suppose if, I'm if she, if she was never going to support any sort of voice in the Constitution because it'll divide us on race, this never would have got up. Well, I don't think the words last night would necessarily have got up. And uh, as you know, David, I, I moved some amendments in the Parliament to try and uh, help more Australians uh, vote yes, and they, uh, they unfortunately didn't get support. Richard Colbeck in the Senate moved but the my, same But my point is even those words amendments. wouldn't have won over Jacinda Price. Well, look, there are always going to be uh, different views in, in, in our party room in relation to this, in the joint party room. And I think, uh, um, you know, if you're going to put a referendum to Australians, we know how hard this is. Um, you need to start with a process that brings everybody to the table from day one. Was it, a, was it misinformation to say that this voice would divide us on race? David, as you know, I argued the no case and, uh, and I rebutted uh, uh, claims that the... Sorry, I argued the yes case, I argued with the no case on many of the, the claims they were making. And this is the, the principal argument of the no case that I disagreed with. It's the reason why I, I campaigned for yes. And the reason why I disagreed with it is because we've had the race power since 1901. 
the only people who've ever made laws about um, on the basis of their race are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So the claim, the claim that it divides us on race was wrong, in your view? I disagreed with it, absolutely. W was it misinformation? No, it was um, a, a, a debating point in the context of a referendum. Uh, and what do you do in the context of a debate? You, you contest the ideas. It sounds like a bit of a nuance, though. How I'm a nuanced man, David. <laughs> How, a debating point, you say, but it's either right or wrong, isn't it? Whether, whether this body would divide us by race. Well, I argued that it wouldn't divide us by race because we've had those provisions there. They argued that no other racial group gets a body like this. So these were people making arguments on both sides and we had a debate and the no side won. What do you make of the, the way the campaign went, uh, the tone of the campaign? It wasn't just misinformation. Uh, but it was the racism that we saw um, at many times throughout the, uh, the campaign, some pretty abhorrent stuff. Are you worried about where campaigning in Australia has gone now? I called out some of the uh, behaviour at different times um, uh, as a member of the... Uh, as somebody who was campaigning, yes. Um, and I think there were, there were people that said uh, bad things on both sides of the debate. That's the nature of, of this. And, you know, I think it's important that people involved in, in the debate from time to time call out some of these things. Um, I've, I've said in the course of the debate that I'm worried about extremes in our politics, that the Corbynite left and the Trumpian right. Um, uh, I think uh, Australians always have to focus on the vast middle, and yesterday the vast middle voted no. Did we see Trumpian tactics in this campaign? Oh, look, I called out some of the things that occurred at the CPAC conference. That was the, the, the sort of things that I, was, uh, that I was drawing attention to, as I called out... Uh, the decision of the Labor Party in relation to Israel at, the, uh, at their conference, which I thought was about uh, appeasing the Corbynite wing. So what happens now uh, when it comes to, well, firstly, constitutional recognition? We just heard Richard Miles, the Deputy Prime Minister, say, that's it. This was, they tried hard for this model, but that, that's it. We know Peter Dutton is suggesting another referendum on symbolic constitutional recognition. What do you think? Well, I think just in the days ahead, the first thing we've got to do is do three things. Got to reach out to Indigenous friends and colleagues and check in on them because a number of them will be feeling the, the result yesterday. I, I want to reiterate read, read what everyone has said. This is not a result about whether Australians support Indigenous people or not. It's a, it's a referendum on a particular model of constitutional recognition. Secondly, I think we need to reflect on what the, the actual result means. And I think we, we need to be slow to move to the next phase or the next referendum without, without that proper reflection. And, as we know, what, what are some of the key ingredients for a referendum on this? You need to build Indigenous support, you need to have bipartisan support, and it needs to be put at a time when it's got the best chance of success. And the third thing we need to do, we need to recommit to the reconciliation process. And I think the one thing that all sides agreed last night was that Indigenous disadvantage is the, is the top issue, and that's around closing the gap and recommit to the closing the gap process. What you've just said there is that we need to pause for a while on the idea of constitutional recognition. When we do return to this at some point, there has to be Indigenous agreement behind whatever's put forward. How important is that? Because we don't hear that necessarily from Peter Dutton. I think that ha that is obviously going to be a particular element in this. I mean, uh, uh, I think the panel rightly said, what was one of the reasons that Australians voted no here? Because there were a range of different Indigenous voices um, in relation to this proposition. And I think uh, that indicated to Australians that the support from Indigenous people wasn't unanimous. Now, you're never going to get unanimous support among Indigenous people. You shouldn't expect to. But you want to try and build consensus if you're going to do this again. You uh, quit your shadow ministry role to support the yes vote. Um, what happens for you now? Would you like to be back on the front bench? David, I'm the Liberal member for Barara. Um, I, I am the Liberal member because my party members have endorsed me and, be, and I'm the member for Barrowry because my community has endorsed me. Anything beyond that is a matter for my leader. I said when I stepped down I was going to do three things. I was going to work hard for the people of Barrowry and I've been doing that every day on issues in relation to telco and roads and postal services and bushfire preparedness. I said I would, you know, campaign very hard for, for this referendum and I did over 100 events, meetings, speeches and the like. I, I gave it my all. And the third thing I said I would do is that I would campaign hard for the election of a Liberal government under the leadership of Peter Dutton, and I intend to bring the same energy that I brought to the referendum campaign to that task. Well, do you blame Peter Dutton no. for this outcome? No, I don't. So you're happy to return to the front bench if there's an opening? Well, look, that's a matter for Peter Dutton. I, I, I'm, I'm focused on my community as the member for Barara. All right. Um, well, we'll see whether you end up back on the front bench. Um, look, just can I turn to Israel and Gaza? Um, we were discussing there with the Deputy Prime Minister what's 
considered imminent, a ground invasion of Gaza. How justified do you think Israel is in the steps that uh, it could be about to take? Israel has an absolute right to defend itself. 1,300 Jewish people died um, last, last weekend. It's the largest number of Jewish people killed in a single day since the Holocaust. There were people going to a dance party who were murdered in the street. There were babies who were kidnapped, caged, ca captured and killed. Uh, there were Holocaust survivors that were kidnapped. Um, this was a horrific event. Um, if this was Australia and this had happened here, we would absolutely uh, yeah. be, be, be wanting to defend ourselves. So Israel does have a right to defend itself, absolutely, uh, and to, uh, to try and remove the threat of Hamas from the area. Hamas is uh, pledged to wipe Israel off the map. It doesn't recognise its right to exist and it is engaged in terror tactics. We in Australia list Hamas as a terrorist organisation. So Israel has an absolute right to defend itself. What about Iran? Should Australia be cutting ties with Iran? I think we have to reconsider the, the, the relationship with Iran. Um, anybody who doesn't think Iran has been supporting and financing Hamas over the years just hasn't been paying attention. Iran is the great disruptor in the Middle East. It's disrupting Lebanon, it's disrupted Syria. Uh, it is a malevolent force. We've seen from our, from our own Iranian diaspora in the last uh, few years the, the issues around the treatment of its own people, of women, of religious minorities, of anybody who doesn't conform with their regime. And I think we have to ask ourselves, why do we maintain this diplomatic relationship? So you don't accept those arguments we, we just heard as to why those relationships uh, and ties are a good idea? I don't have all of the facts before me, and that's why I'm not saying that we should pull out today, but I really think we need to give it a serious reconsideration okay. um, because I think our support for Iran, our, 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 our maintaining diplomatic relations, in a sense gives Iran a level of support and global acceptance that I think we should question. Julian Lisa, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Thanks, David. All right, well, we're going to come back to the Middle East a little later. First, let's return to the panel on the voice referendum. I want to show you these comments too from the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney, last night. I know the last few months have been tough. But be proud of who you are. Be proud of your identity. Be proud of the 65,000 years of history and culture that you are part of and your rightful place in this country. We will carry on and we will move forward and we will thrive. This is not the end of reconciliation. Isabella, um, let me come back to uh, all of you having listened to those interviews and just those comments there from Linda Burney in particular. Isabella, last night you were um, at the YES event uh, in Sydney's Inner West. Is, is that is that sentiment we heard from the Minister there reflected, do you think, amongst other Indigenous Australians that we'll still thrive, that we'll move forward from here, or is there a level of despondency? Look, I think Indigenous Australians are resilient people. They've risen from the ashes many times. Um, when I was talking to people throughout this campaign, they said, our communities won't stop running if this is a no vote. But I think it's also been the conventional wisdom in our communities that when we're talking about reconciliation, we use kind language, we're generous, we extend the hand of friendship, we invite people in to share our culture. And I think if we look at the campaign messaging around The Voice, it was similar to that. So I think this failing, this being rejected so categorically by all Australians, it will change the way Indigenous Australians want to interact with the rest of the country. It will change whether kindness is the best approach. I think often in the community it is well understood that black anger is not tolerated and so we see leaders pull in their rage, pull in their sadness and constantly use language of generosity, use graciousness to try and appeal to the Australian people. And after this, I think there will be a generation of leaders who have been burnt by this and who won't be interested in doing that anymore. This is, uh, I think this is a really fascinating point. Um, when you talk about that kindness and what might now flow from this result, will this swell the ranks of the Black Sovereign Movement, um, you know, those, those behind Lydia Thorpe? And, uh, is that what you're indicating there? I would not be surprised if more people push towards that message that comes from Lydia Thorpe about not engaging so much mm. with mainstream Australia, not bowing to them, um, challenging the Australian regime. And of course there will be anger. I think even if you weren't a card-carrying yes voter in the Indigenous community, to see the vote, to see Australians reject this so categorically, mm. that's really hard 
to feel, to experience. The whole debate was very uncomfortable. It felt like at times the worth of an Indigenous life was being debated. So I think the message from people like Lydia Thorpe, the message around black sovereignty will appeal more after yeah, this. Yeah, do you agree? Yeah, look, I, I think, importantly for Indigenous people, our lives are being discussed every day in the media, in pubs and clubs, and there was really a... We saw it as a vote on us. And I think for that to be rejected, people obviously feel despondent. Um, but I think there's also been good comments about, you know, we live in no now. Um, we, we woke up yesterday in no, we woke up today in no. We No is now, so not much will change. A lot of the communities we spoke to, they had this sense of, look, it, Indigenous Affairs is in the national agenda now. People are saying we need action, we need all that. That circus is going to move on and it's moved on in generations past and the media focus will focus on something else. But the lives, the day-to-day -day lives of Aboriginal people in regional remote will still be the same. You know, they'll still be fighting issues of uh, heart disease in Cape York, of youth suicide in WA, incarceration rates all around the country. That will still go on and maybe the spotlight will be taken off and brought back in, in generations. What I think our communities as well are very used to that kind of yeah. rhetoric of kindness from politicians, yeah. but no action that follows yeah. up. The issue is, you know, reconciliation is something from the 90s. There, there should be an end date to reconciliation. When does this nation say we have reconciled with the fundamental grievance of our relationship with First Nations people and where they fit in our nation's history? That started in the 90s. We're now 20, 30 years on. What about the push for recognition in the Constitution? I mean, that's been running for... What we're discussing it then. David, I, The John Howard era. I, Is that dead now? I think it's dead. I, I think it's dead. You know, well, we've had two re referendums for some sort of constitutional recognition. One in the plebis... One, one in the, the plebis... Um, preamble. The preamble. Um, I, I won't live to see another referendum. But is that the oh. missed opportunity here? Because I look back now and I think, OK, well, in June it was clearly not in a good place, this whole movement. Was the alternative scenario a two-question, you know, approach? Ask for recognition in the Constitution as something at the referendum. Put forward the voice as well if you want it and, and seek to have that enshrined in the Constitution, but at least in a different scenario, there may at least have been recognition but, but it's out got to of be, this it's outcome. Got to be recognition. Could, Julian think, Lees yeah. is right, isn't he? It's got well, to be something that Indigenous Australians want. That's why I'm putting that's, it forward as, as something that we have to discuss now when we look back at this. Was there another yeah. way? Could it have just been recognition? Yes, you could have put forward the voice as well. But in this, this was all or nothing for the Australian yeah. people. They did not get a choice. But if it's a recognition... It had to be yes or no on this model. If, if it's a recognition that Indigenous Australians aren't backing... That's going nowhere. I, I think and it would have come across yeah. as quite paternalistic from the government to say, this is what you asked for, but this is what we're going to give you. I don't think it would have been palatable in a lot of Indigenous yeah. communities. And we heard rhetoric, uh, the voice isn't going to create real change for what was symbolic recognition going to do. Uh, people would have woken up to a yes vote and their lives would have looked more or less exactly the same. That was the argument we heard when they were presenting the voice to parliament model. Yeah, and, and I think, and, look, the, the, the symbolic recognition... There was a real big issue. People were saying, Indigenous people were saying, it's really tough for us to accept that 97% of Australia will tell the 3% of what's best for them. And it wasn't symbolic uh, recognition. Aboriginal people have decided we want something that is more meaningful in our communities. Mm. So it, uh, your comment, JP, that that's it, recognition in the Constitution is dead. I think it was pretty clear... Look, in my, I'm Miles. saying in my lifetime... Well, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're necessarily wrong because Richard Miles made it pretty clear they're not going to return to this. Yeah. In fact, I think any sort of referendum um, after off. this result yeah. is off yeah. the cards yeah. for, yeah. well, Partly because quite some time. Because of the way we've... Not just on, on this decision, but also on the way we've seen the campaign yeah. done. Yeah. You know, there has been misinformation, there have been lies, it's been a very aggressive campaign. I think we're going to see a bigger debate now about things like truth in political advertising. Yeah. Mm. We, we didn't even know who donated to either campaign because the disclosure laws are so hopeless. We won't find out so for ages. A, yeah, mm. exactly. So there's a lot of questions about how campaigns are run and the reward for the No campaign was a highly negative campaign worked for them. Now, I think we do have the prospect of a spiral of negativity in campaigning in general. We could see that reflected at the next general election. Yeah, absolutely. These are going to be issues yeah. that last for a long time out of this outcome. Just on the politics, uh, David, we know, you know the political implications aren't everything here, but um, there will be implications. This is a setback for Anthony Albanese. Mm. Peter Dutton will you know, be feeling pretty confident after um, you know, the success of the No campaign. But does that 
mean, what, what does that mean for the rest of this parliamentary term and elections uh, down the track? I think there are going to be questions about Anthony Albanese on his own side. The people within the government could see that this campaign was not being run properly, was not effective enough, and that dismayed them. Questions and and you're, talking, you're talking there about um, explaining to people why this was a good idea, how it would make a practical Just difference. Just day-to-day campaign management. They didn't look that great. So are they ready to fight in a general election? And to be fair, it's not just government, that's the Yes campaign. There was campaign. the Yes 23 side yeah. as well. I want to make a point about the campaigning and I think a challenge that was always going to exist in this referendum is I think the best model in Indigenous communities is that it's grassroots led. That's in real contradiction to how we often see political campaigning where it's centralised, mm, yeah. it's disciplined, there's one message that's spread to everyone. So I think there was a hope that grassroots communities would lead this, would drive this, but it was confusing perhaps to the media or the public who have come to expect something different in campaigns. That's a very good point. Could I get on to you know, the issue of what does it mean for yeah. Peter Dutton? Because we're all going to be talking about this before the next general yeah. election. He's clearly the winner. His, his tactics paid off. He emerges with greater authority. He will be a conservative champion to people on his own side after getting this outcome. He has conveyed a sense of anger, I think, and aggression, sometimes fueling a sense of crisis in his, in his press appearances. And I, <laughs> I wonder whether that's really what people will want when he gets towards a general election. But we can also see the other clear factor here. In the Teal seats, um, the Teal independent MPs supporting The Voice have indicated their electorates are in favour. There's still no indication that Peter Dutton has got a way to win back the, those Liberal heartlands. And even though he may think that there's support out in the suburbs now for him, I'm not convinced that a, a vote on the on the voice is any indication of where people will vote in those suburbs on a general election when we get back to issues like the cost of living. No, you yeah. might be right. He'll have a spring in his step and certainly uh, a big win for Jacinta Price as well. Her yeah. influence within the coalition and the conservative side of politics in Australia has grown enormously uh, through all of this, there's no doubt about it. Look, we've got to move on. Um, there'll be a lot of analysis and discussion around the outcome of this referendum, I know, for a long time. We are going to turn now to the Middle East. JP, we're going to let you go. Thank yep. you very much for backing up this morning after Thank your you. coverage last night and joining us this morning. Um, Isabella and uh, David are going to stick around for this discussion. And the former ABC Middle East correspondent, Adam Harvey, will be joining us in a moment as well. First, a look back at a week that's completely disrupted the status quo in the Middle East, a week that began with those horrific Hamas attacks and ended with the world bracing for Israel's response. Without warning, without precedent, hundreds of Hamas fighters spilled from the Gaza Strip and swarmed towards Israeli military posts, armed with sophisticated weapons Hi, mate. How are you? and absolute surprise. Uh, hi, Isabella. How are you? Huge rocket attack. We saw a massive volume of rockets come over from Gaza. Those bangs you can hear now, that's uh, the Iron Dome, uh, which is shooting most of them out of the sky. But uh, they are everywhere, and this is uh, obviously a strategy of Hamas. Every moment uh, that Israelis here think that uh, the threat level has gone, they launch a another huge volley of rockets. In the biggest escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in decades, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country was at war. <laughs> Fresh rounds of strikes have been launched at Gaza as Israel warns of a long and difficult war ahead. We stand with Israel. There is no power in the Strip. The main hospital has warned if it doesn't get desperately needed supplies, it will become a morgue. The destruction is beyond imagination. Stop this carnage. The nation's political leaders have condemned a pro-Palestinian rally outside the Sydney Opera House last night. I saw anti-Semitism being expressed, which I think is antithetical to who we are as a country. I don't know where the border force is looking at whether those people are permanent residents, uh, if they're citizens, if they're visa holders. If they're visa holders, the visa should be cancelled immediately. Whatever people's views about what has occurred to date or what should occur in the future, that does not justify the sort of violence 
the murdering of civilians and the hostage taking we have seen Hamas engage in. On both sides, we're seeing uh, it's civilians' lives that are being torn apart following Hamas's attack. Before we get back to the panel, I spoke a short time ago to the ABC's Global Affairs editor, John Lyons, who's in Jerusalem. John Lyons, good to talk to you. Look, when is Israel's ground invasion of Gaza likely to begin? And look, what's it likely to involve? Well, David, I think it could be happening any time now. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, uh, went and visited his troops a short time ago and said to them, the next stage is coming. The Israeli Defence Forces have issued a statement a short time ago saying that they are preparing to implement a wide range of operational offensive plans which can include combined and coordinated strikes from the air, sea and land. And they talked about an expanded area of combat and with an emphasis on significant ground operations. So that's the first time the Israeli army has formally confirmed that there will be a ground invasion of Gaza. I expect it could be within the next 12 to 24 hours. How desperate, John, is the situation now for the civilians in Gaza? They've been told to leave or at least move to the south of Gaza. How possible is that? Where can they go? Well, David, it is already a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. This is a, a, a strip of land with 2.3 million people, one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Now, if you imagine, to put it into perspective for an Australian audience, if you imagine cutting Canberra in half and putting 2.3 or 2.5 million people into a half of Canberra, essentially the population of Brisbane into half of Canberra, and then... There are 6,000 bombs dropped on those, that area in the last week. There, they have no fuel, water, medicine or anything going in. And then they're trying to move now from Gaza City down to the south of the place. So it's desperate. There's a lot of fear going on. Um, they're trying to work out what they do with people in the main hospitals there. So it's... And a lot of it's been destroyed. Entire neighbourhoods have been destroyed and destroyed in the last few days by uh, Israeli bombing raids. And Benjamin Netanyahu has said this is only the beginning. So from the point of view of the people in Gaza, there is really nowhere to go, as you say. What is the attitude then amongst Israelis towards all of this and, and, and now the prospect of a ground invasion? Is there strong support to go in regardless of, of that humanitarian concern? Yes, there is, David. And the reason for that is, of course, a week ago, there was the horrific um, actions and behaviour of the Hamas fighters coming across the border, crashing through as many as 1,500 of them. They committed all sorts of atrocities, which, in my view, amount to war crimes on a major scale. They slaughtered, they, they burnt people alive. And so the, the mood here in Israel... I've lived here in the past for several years. I've never seen anything like the anger, the determination here. Their view is that there may be uh, civilian casualties. Of course there will be civilian casualties, but the sense of anger at what the Hamas fighters did, uh, to the human rights abuses they committed, the taking of hostages, the horrible scenes. Um, and so the view here in Israel is we have to do whatever it takes to go in there and try to, for once and for all, kill Hamas's leadership, its infrastructure and civilians will be collateral damage. That's a very strong sentiment here. Our Global Affairs Editor, John Lyons, joining us from Jerusalem. Thank you, John. Thanks, David. And Adam Harvey joins uh, the panel now. Good to have you with us this morning. Uh, former Middle East correspondent, just sticking with Gaza, and to just give us all a better understanding of what's going on in there. So the, the, the food, fuel, water was cut off, was it four or five days ago? Things must be getting pretty desperate in there. Is it easy for people to get out or, or move away from where this ground invasion is going to happen? Well, I think there's t there are two roads open. That Israel has said it won't uh, attack any vehicles on those roads. But as John was pointing out, it's very difficult for that amount of people to move south, to move from the north half of Gaza to the southern half of Gaza. Um, imagine <clears throat> trying to bring sick relatives with you or even get fuel for your car to, to oh, yeah. move south. It's, it's a logistical operation that, frankly, is quite impossible. And you'll see, I think, a lot of people stay. 
uh, in the northern half of Gaza. The big fear that many people have is that they'll leave and never be allowed to come back. What happens after this operation is over? Will, will Israel allow people to come back in or will they be forced to stay in the southern part of Gaza? And how many homes Gaza? will be standing if you know, they're, they're um, really going to be going after the Hamas leadership? T just tell us a bit more about that population in Gaza, the level of support for Hamas um, you know, and, and what, what, what was done a week ago. Do the civilians in Gaza, how would they view what's, what's happening? Well, Hamas has popular support in Gaza. Um, there was an opinion poll out a couple of years ago which showed that about 50% of the population of Gaza supports Hamas. Um, and indeed, Hamas won popular elections there in, back in 2005, I think. Uh, mm. So they won a, a, majority, while ago now, but... a majority of seats. That's right, elections in 2021 were postponed, I think, because the Palestinian Authority thought that Hamas would would pick up even more seats. Mm. Um, so it has popular support. That's not to say that there is popular support for atrocities and war crimes and um, the murdering of children. Um, you can't say that at all. What's going on there now? I think people are trying to leave as quickly as they can, those people who, who can leave, because the urban warfare that's to come will undoubtedly be terrible. Um, Back in 2014, Israel said it destroyed about 60 miles of tunnels going underneath uh, and through Gaza. They've had 10 years now to, to prepare fighting positions and tunnels, and this operation was, was in train for at least a year. So. And, and that, Isabella, um, underscores the difficulty of the ground invasion. It's pretty clear Israel is going to go in, but it's not going to be easy. As good as their defence forces might be, uh, this is the most, what is it, densely populated mm. place in the, on the planet. How difficult do you think this is and how messy is this going to get? Well, I think for civilians this is the really critical period to get out because we know in warfare it gets to a point where it does become too late. You can't leave and more or less you're trapped to stay in a basement. And that's something that we saw all over Ukraine. People who were trapped in basements once the warfare became too intense, too heavy. So the amount of time they can buy to get out as it, we just heard it's extremely difficult to get those resources. Yeah. Um, having witnessed people try and escape war zones, uh, carrying elder relatives, people with disabilities, it is extremely, yeah. extremely you difficult. You witnessed a lot of this in Ukraine. Yeah, and um, I think the images that we've seen, because it is so densely populated, because there is such a shortage of resources, uh, it will be incredibly, incredibly challenging. And as you said, I think um, it for Israel, it's a really big job ahead if they do as they say they're going to do and get in there. But I think everyone is thinking of those civilians uh, in these days ahead. And David, you can see Israel um, is, is concerned about sentiment shifting, right? The world, we just heard the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, very supportive mm. of Israel's right to defend itself after what happened. But if this turns into a drawn out and, and very costly humanitarian disaster in Gaza, of course, sentiment might shift. How do you see that going? I think that will be one factor, but I think recent history shows that, that uh, if, if, it, if there's a terror attack on Israel, then they respond very strongly. And they've done that in the past in Gaza, and they've done it elsewhere. And that leads to civilian deaths in, in Gaza. We know that's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Once, once a, an operation of this scale, which basically will turn into a a full-scale war on the ground in that, in that particular area, there'll be civilian deaths. And I don't think that um, the international message will sway a country that has been mm. so caught by surprise by the ferocity of that, of that terror attack that we yeah. saw from Hamas. And, and subject to such a horrific uh, attack. Um, this, of course, plays out around the world, but uh, what we've seen in, in Australia, Adam, in Sydney in particular over the last week has really been quite alarming. Uh, the Monday night, the decision was made to light up the Sydney Opera House in the colours of the Israeli flag, but incredibly, instead of um, Jewish people being able to go and show their solidarity, they were told to stay home, uh, and a pro-Palestinian protest marched down there, and w we saw some of the anti-Semitic chants, um, gas the Jews, and, and so on. What happened there? How did, how did this all happen? Well, I, 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 I think, you know, it was an attempt to protest, I think, the... the, the lighting up of the Opera House, as you, as you say. Um, but it came so quickly after those terrible atrocities, I, I think. 
36 hours after we mm. were still just getting stories of, of, um, of you know, the terrible things that had happened in some of those kibbutzes and uh, the music festival. Uh, so it was a time to grieve and mourn, I think, and, and what it ended up being was an anti-Israel protest. Um, that may not have been the intention of the protest organisers. They wanted it to, to uh, I suppose, foreshadow what was about to happen. They knew mm. what was likely to come. The people who were shouting those slogans at the end of the night were a very small number of people, um, very loud, and they got all the attention. Uh, I don't think it's a fair representation of what the entire protest was about. But um, w when things like that happen, that's what the coverage is about. That's, that's mm. the story of that protest now. What about Labor at the state level in New South Wales, David, and, and federally as well? We know, it's no you know, um, big scoop to reveal, that there are divisions within Labor when it comes to Israel-Palestine. Mm. And it, it did seem that some were a little careful, cautious, over-cautious about responding to this and, initially. And there was a terrible message. There was a terrible message, which was to people of the Jewish faith in Sydney, don't go to the Opera House because the Palestinian protest was there. And I think that was, you know, a really bad message to send. And I think that reflects badly on the New South Wales state government. Although I think later, the New South Wales Premier, Chris Minns, was sort of rock solid well, on... he apologised. Yeah, he apologised that. And I think inside, he's angry at the way that all played out mm. because he has no, you know, tolerance for some of the things that Adam referred to at that protest. But I think more generally, the Labor response... I think the response on all sides, I think it was such an awful attack, it needed a totally clear moral repudiation of what happened. From the Prime Minister? From the Prime Minister, from all sides of politics. And I think, you know, we've been caught up in a voice debate and so forth, but it needed that total moral repudiation of the terrorist attack. And I think calling for restraint is a very difficult thing to do so soon after the attack, something that Penny Wong used. It's a normal word in diplomacy, calling for restraint. Mm. But how do you ask for restraint? How do you restrain your pain at an attack well, like that? Or your, or your rage yeah. at that attack? Well, Peter Dutton was quite critical of the Prime Minister for, <clears throat> well, a number of things, not going and addressing a synagogue early enough in the week. He did on Wednesday mm. night. Yeah. But, and, and not having an immediate meeting of the National Security Committee of Cabinet. Here he was. It is unbelievable at a time when we've got world leaders who are without any reservation whatsoever lending their support to, uh, to Benjamin Netanyahu, to the people of Israel. Uh, our Prime Minister, it seems, hasn't made any phone call uh, and hasn't even convened the National Security Committee. It's a very, very significant issue uh, and it's not over yet. Was that fair or was that him just trying to score points I, on a national security issue? A national security... A committee meeting of federal cabinet is not the test. That's not the test. Mm. Um, I thought that... You'd still think the... there'd be one, though. Well, there were briefings from security officials. I mean, that was happening inside the government. That is, mm. that, that is underway. I think um, you can question uh, some of the response on Monday, but by Wednesday, I mean, Penny Wong's speech mm. to the Israeli-Australia Chamber of Commerce was Very totally strong. clear on support for Israel. Very good on, on the response here. And I think also the Prime Minister going to the synagogue on Wednesday night in Melbourne, absolutely the right thing to and, do. And they got the repatriation flights at least uh, first couple out, but now, uh, who knows, interesting to hear. Yeah, the... so I think national security meeting was setting up a false test on national security, and I think that we have seen Peter Dutton being fairly loose with some of his language, and I, I do question that. I think that loose language in a time like this is not wise. It's actually a... a a sign. Of, it's, it's, it's not a good sign for, a, for an aspiring leader. And then, of course, there was the rare statement from the ASIO boss who came out and said, mm. look, this doesn't change our domestic terror threat, but what's important is managing our communities. And we know that the emotions run so deep here, that anger is running so deep, so inflammatory language is, mm. can be really problematic. Yeah, my understanding, not directed at Peter Dutton, but generally saying to everybody, words really matter at a situation like this, very, very volatile situation like this. Look, the one unequivocal bit of good news this week was Chung Lei, the Australian journalist who's been detained in China for three years, finally returned home to Melbourne. Her return brings an end to a very difficult few years for Ms Cheng and her family. This is an outcome that the Australian government has been seeking for a long period of time and her return will be warmly welcomed, not just by her family and friends, but by all Australians. 
It's, uh, look, it's great news for Chung Lei, Young Heng Jun, the other Australian remains in detention in, in China. Uh, but this, just before the Prime Minister, funnily enough, uh, goes to visit Beijing in the coming weeks. Uh, what does it mean, Isabella, do you think about the nature of the relationship now? Oh, it's a small gesture. Uh, I think it's still... There's a lot of concern for journalists in that regime. Uh, a small gesture, perhaps uh, a hand of goodwill as he approaches. Is it enough to change the relationship? Mm. It's still going to be a difficult relationship, we know. Of course. Um, but this would have been uh, overshadowing the visit, wouldn't and, it, David? And it's in the context of some positive moves on the trade sanctions. Hmm. When Anthony Albanese became Prime Minister, he said, you know, normalising the relationship depends on China stepping back from those trade bans. And we have seen some progress on that front. Uh, so I think there's a realistic approach from the Australian government here. And it is, you know, I think immensely positive that they've released Chiang Lai. Uh, it took an, a, an awful lot of work. Uh, I think as a journalist, we're sort of incredibly, incredibly relieved that she's mm -hmm. now back in yep. Melbourne. And kudos to the Australian ambassador mm -hmm. in Beijing, Graham Fletcher, who who did so much work on that. Yep, not an easy thing to navigate. All right, well, our panel, David Crow, Isabella Higgins, Adam Harvey, will be back very shortly with some final observations. Time now, though, for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with Birupai Man from up around Port Macquarie, the one and only Jack Lattimore, who's the Aboriginal Affairs Journalist for The Age. And a very warm welcome, mate. Nice to meet you, Mike. Mate, um, it's been a long and bruising campaign, but the Australian people have spoken and it was a pretty resounding no. Disappointing for family, yep. for communities, everyone that I've spoken to over the past two years. Yep. Um, but life goes on. Jack, the, the Uluru Statement from the Heart was a real focus this year, but it wasn't just this year, was it? Kathy Wilcox's cartoon from 2017 has Malcolm Turnbull in it. The punters here are uh, sort of uh, talking to him and they're saying... After more than 200 years, we propose a referendum to grant Indigenous people a voice in the Constitution. Ooh, I don't know. Australians don't like it when you <laughs> spring change on them. Most previous governments had put it in the two-hard basket, but on election night... Anthony Albanese came out and said, basically, this is a core promise, we're going to do this. Looking back at the photos from when the legislation went through, there was real joy and hope. For a flicker there, um, there was the same sort of sense of relief uh, as we've seen with the apology um, that was frustrated for so long. Unfortunately, the bipartisanship did not last. David Rowe, I think, captured it perfectly. And so it begins. And he's got mm. um, the, the sign painter, Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, putting up October 14, save the date. And he's got Warren Mundine and uh, Jacinta and David Littleproud and Peter Dutton here putting a big no on so it reads Noctober. Yeah, perfect. Captured it perfectly. Mark Knight's done this lovely cartoon where he's got Peter Dutton on the, the stage of the voice show and wearing his no T-shirt. Will, will he be wearing this no T-shirt for the rest of his life? Of course not. I mean, he can do Dancing with the Stars. We've seen it before. Australians love a redemption story. I won't follow him for long. Johannes Leek has done this cartoon where he's got one of the uh, Yes campaign leaders. Remember, there's no point preaching to converted. Is that a valid argument? Did they do too much of that, do you think? That was certainly uh, a, a hot topic that I heard, was what they should be doing, um, where they were spending their time, as opposed to who needed that time. So, yeah, got it there. The main spokespeople, Warren Mundine and um, Jacinta Price, they certainly got out of the blocks very quickly. Did they have an easier job, no, than yes? It's always easier to tear something down than to build it, uh, that old maxim. Some of the information that was uh, perhaps misleading was widely shared um, and it, it sort of mobilised people. Jim Pavlidis did this cartoon, a vote no spelt K-N-O-W, uh, staked through the history of Australia. I just thought it was very prescient and clever cartoon. Yeah, people need to do the research. One of the um, highlights for me in covering this was um, spending a little bit of time with Michael Long, who's just such an outgoing and generous soul. The Prime Minister and many other Yes people joined him in Canberra for the final leg. He wasn't out there for a stroll. He, was, he, had the, he still had that fire in his eyes from the field. 
The Prime Minister returned to Uluru, where it all began this week, and two of the local Ananju women, um, Rene Kulicha and Julepi Carroll, did a specially new dance they'd made where they held their digging sticks above their head to signify the burden for First Nations people. Wasn't carrying just the campaign for yes, but they were carrying the impact of some of the, the hate that was online. Um, that was all that was all really tangible uh, in the lives of in the lives of mob. Do you think it's done permanent damage? That stuff is really sticky. So yeah, yeah I think it has. This was uh, the Prime Minister, and this was uh, Reggie Uluru, who the the rocks named after this family. <laughs> He's um, he was quite a quite a character. I couldn't help but draw parallels with Bob Hawke and sitting down in 1988 uh, in the dirt, and when the Barunga statement was um, handed over to him. Mm. Let's hope there's a longer, there's a better lasting effect with the Uluru statement. So it's not about the artefact. Um, it's about the actual impact. I've always said that Aboriginal aspirations and advancement requires people sitting at all points around the campfire. So, you know, again, hopefully we'll come together and, and work towards the next thing, whatever that is. Jack, it's been a great pleasure uh, unpicking how photographers and cartoonists have covered the referendum, and except for your Collingwood beanie, you've been terrific. <laughs> <laughs> There's 12 months of celebrating with this uh, and it's a pleasure to join you on the show and um, back to you, Spearsy. Jack, thank you. Thank you, Mike, as well. Let's get some final observations. David, to you first. There were 6 million people, roughly, we don't know the final tally, but we know the percentages, who voted in favour of The Voice. I think we should, you know... well. I don't want to see assumptions about this painting Australia as a racist or a backward country. I think that would be just the wrong way to interpret this result because there are people of good faith who didn't like this model and they felt they had a good reason to vote no. And I think that's important to recognise. There is going to be a debate about misinformation, but I think that can't be taken to the point where we kind of deny the reality of the verdict from the Australian people. And that's really important when the next step has got to be about practical change that closes the gap and actually achieves an outcome. And I don't think Australians will have much patience for a lot of speechifying on that. They'll just expect government to get on with it. Isabella. I think our thoughts are with the Indigenous communities in which we know that there is real heartbreak, real disappointment from this verdict. I think there will be plenty of time for reflection. Uh, there'll be many verdicts on what went wrong. I think in the week ahead, this is the time for mourning and hopefully that this country can find a way of healing. And Adam. Well, I've seen the consequences of extremism in lots of places, from Bali to Syria to the Philippines and uh, um, in Israel as well. And I think it's important as this goes on to keep appealing to people's better instincts to listen to each other and to grieve the losses on both sides, whether it's civilians who are killed in Gaza City or in Kibbutz Berry, because if we don't, extremism thrives and that leads to more deaths and more pain. Well said. Thank well you all said. very much for uh, an extended show this morning and uh, all of that analysis this morning. Look, it's quite honestly been a pretty difficult week to find anything amusing to close our show with. And we know, as Isabella touched on, this is going to be a painful day for many First Nations Australians who were hoping for a yes vote last night. So we'll leave you with a message from Catherine Little last night, an advocate for Indigenous children and families. Thanks for watching. My final thoughts um, actually go to mob who are hurting right now and what I want to say is you're going to be okay. We will get through this. You're going to come back stronger. We will continue to look for those solutions. We will continue to push. You're going to be okay. We got you.